imagine I'm being paid a king's ransom to, for this job, standing up here doing this, so just run with me. Um, I had, personally, I have found Dick extremely generous always with his time and his knowledge. Whenever I see him on an outback apron, he's always got a smile and a chat. Um, he has, I, just for kicks and giggles, I read, I read his resume the other day. He is the guru of aviation adventure. He makes, he's crisscrossed the globe in helis, in fixed swing, and in balloons. He makes my, <clears throat> makes my outback jaunts look like play school. Yeah, cheers for that, Dick. Anyway, please, let's welcome Dick Smith. Thanks very much. I want you to imagine you're with me in the little tiny helicopter, the Jet Ranger, it's smaller than a mini minor, and you're searching for a ship in the Northern Pacific. Back when I did my flight around the world in the Jet Ranger 1982-83, uh, the reason no one had flown around the world in a helicopter is because you couldn't get through the Soviet Union and a helicopter hasn't got the range to get across the Pacific Ocean. I came up with this idea when I decided on the flight that I would land in Russia twice and I would get approval to do this. But as a backstop, I, I made up a story. I said, otherwise, if they won't give me approval, I'll land on a ship and refuel and then fly into Alaska. You wouldn't believe it. I wanted to dine the Russian ambassador, but I couldn't get approval to land in Russia. And so in the end, I had to land on that ship. And so you're with me in the helicopter. We're above eight eighths a cloud. The ship pulls up, it's estimated about 80 miles away because in those days before GPS, you never really knew where you were. I'd made up a non-directional beep, a little box of dicks with electronic parts. And uh, my friend dangled a wire over the crane. He was on the ship, got on at Yokohama. The ship was going uh, to Seattle. People said, where was the ship waiting? It wasn't waiting, it was just cruising. And so it was like, a space shuttle organisation because I had to make sure I didn't leave too early uh, to get to the ship because then the ship would be too far from Alaska at the end of the chain and if I left too late I wouldn't be able to get to the ship. So here I was above the cloud and the, the uh, ship's captain sent a message via ham radio back to Sydney. My friend on the ship, Don Richards was a ham radio operator and he had his rig there and they said the ship's run into fog you won't be able to land. I remember thinking, to the left of me I can see volcanoes sticking out of the cloud. And I'm sitting there in this tiny little machine with a little life jacket on thinking, wow, what am I going to do? How am I going to go into the Soviet Union? I'm looking for a ship in the North Pacific and it's run into fog. Can you tell the authorities in Australia that I'm heading towards the Soviet Union and to come and get me? The captain couldn't believe he kept asking for me to repeat what I was saying. So I descended down through the cloud. And I remember looking at the radar altimeter thinking, I hope I come out before I hit the surface of the water. And at about a thousand feet I came out of the cloud and in front of me were these orca whales rolling. And I thought, wow, that's a good luck charm. And there ahead, I reckon 60 miles away I could see the ship. I obviously couldn't. It was imagination. But as I got closer, that he turned on the beacon and I was only about 10 degrees out in my estimate. The ship also had a 500 kilohertz emergency transmitter that they turned on. At eight miles, the ship's radar picked me up and I did my first ever landing on a ship. The interesting thing was we rolled the drums up and I made one mistake. I had seven hours to get to the ship, about 700 nautical miles, one hour to refuel and then seven hours to get to Alaska just before last light the day before I left because I not only went through six different time zones, I landed on the day before I left. And or was it the day after, I can't remember, no, it was the day before. And the interesting thing was that as the ship was rolling, the uh, fuel cap on, fuel filler on a jet range was on the side. And I unfortunately landed uh, at uh, Monticelli on the ship and the fuel would keep coming out. So we'd have to whack the cap back on, wait for the low roll of the ship, it was a container ship and then we'd pump a bit more fuel in. So it took two hours to refuel. I had to be full to the brim, about 20% over gross weight. And I remember pulling the collective as I lifted off and got to 100%. It wasn't lifting, but you're allowed for 15 seconds, 120%. So I went to 120%, got unstuck, pushed the nose forward. I'm told later, just missed one of the deck studs on the ship as I took off and I flew around. But that was an exciting day. I managed to get into Alaska right at the end of last light 
and uh, it was an experience because in those days, and I'm pleased that the first two flights of the five flights I've done around the world, the first two were without GPS. My last two flights in the Cessna caravan, I've had a moving map GPS and Iridium phone. Wow, does that make a difference. I think you'll find in future there'll be people, crazy people like Mike Smith, who'll be recreating some of the flights without a GPS. You don't know where you are most of the time, you're terrified. And I'll give you a couple of examples. With the flight in the little jet ranger across the Northern Pacific, across the Northern Atlantic, I'd arranged with Malcolm Fraser that I would land at Balmoral Castle and be met by Prince Charles, who was a helicopter pilot. The mistake was we arranged a time and date because I thought the only way I'll get solo across the Atlantic in helicopters to go in a high pressure system like we have here. Unfortunately, I got this date, I think it was the 12th of August at 10 a.m. that I had to meet Prince Charles and I wanted to go for that date. So I flew across the Atlantic in the middle of a low pressure system and between Greenland and Iceland, I remember weaving in and out through snow flurries and eventually I called a high-flying airline, which was my safeguard, and said, I'm trying to get through to Iceland. They made some calls and came back and said, well, you can't go back to Greenland anyway, it's closed in. But as luck would have it, as I got, I, by the way, I looked down at the ocean below, there was 40 knots blowing across the white caps with bits of icebergs and that, and here I was with my tiny life jacket and my one-man life raft, and I thought, this doesn't sound too good. I remember, I thought, if I can get to Reykjavik alive, I'm going to come up with a reason to put the ship on board, to put the, the uh, helicopter on board a ship and create it home. Eventually, when I got to Reykjavik, there was a ray of sunlight, sort of like a religious thing, on the terminal. And I came in and landed, went in and sat in the coffee shop and had a cup of coffee. And then I thought, oh, I might just go on to London. <laughs> At least I would have found the Atlantic. And in fact, all my flight was like that. But when I left the Faroe Islands, I went to the island of Stornoway and I knew the next morning... I want you to be with me, it's so exciting, I'm going to meet Prince Charles and I'm going to do the first rotary wing solo flight across the Atlantic. Charles Lindbergh was the first one to do a fixed wing. So I thought it was a pretty big deal. I even got my shoes cleaned for Prince Charles. <laughs> luckily, luckily I opened up the map and all it had was a big restricted area around Balmoral Castle. So I rushed in and I bought a street directory. Now that was all I had till the next morning. I left and I flew and I temporarily got misplaced. Uh, Mike Smith would verify with me, us professional amateur pilots never get lost. So I was temporarily misplaced, but down below me was a road junction. And I knew I had to head for Aviemore, a little town called Aviemore, because Barramar Castle was nearby. And so I came down with a chopper, the wonderful things, and I'm hovering about a metre, still quite early in the morning, no cars around. I'm hovering about a metre and reading the road sign and holding my street directory with the left hand. Now that was all okay, except a police car had come over, over the ridge and stopped about 20 metres from me with these two policemen with their mouths open. <laughs> and I can imagine them going back to the police station and saying, you won't believe this, Sarge, there's this helicopter with Qantas and Solo around the world, and there's this bloke looking at the street directory on the roadside. But it saved the day, and I managed to get to, um, to where I was uh, wanting to go. Now that was in 1982-83. In 1987 I flew to the North Pole and I suddenly worked out if I get to the North Pole, every way is south. How will I know to head back to Canada and not head to the Soviet Union? That would be risky. On the first flight I only got to within 90 miles of the pole, which was almost the direction. But what I'd done, I'd sat in the little uh, place at uh, Resolu uh, Resolution, which is a little Eskimo town, and I'd made up a sun compass with a piece of cardboard because I realised the sun went around the world in 24 hours. I think that's one hour for 15 degrees. And I planned the flight to the North Pole so the sun was going to be behind me. I got out to within 90 miles. I then turned around and I managed to use my cardboard sun compass to get back to land, the north bit of Canada. Finally, when I did get to the, to the uh, North Pole the next year, I was very lucky because Twin Otters were taking people out to the North Pole, it's just floating ice. And someone had left a flag there. Can you imagine that? They've been three or four days. The ice moves at a few knots. And so I managed to find this flag, knew I was at the North Pole, and then headed back. 
as I headed back towards the mainland, once again I had a proper, this time I had a proper sun compass. I'm heading back and the weather got so bad and the low stratus got down so it was virtually on the ridge tops of the broken uh, ice and snow that I forced down and I landed and I got out the sleeping bag, put up a tent and I'm sleeping there and at about, or not sleeping, lying there in fear. At about 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, but it was full sunlight, the ice starts breaking up. And I remember grabbing the tent and throwing it in the back of the helicopter. The battery was in the sleeping bag with me. That's a pretty big battery, so I had to put the battery back in into the log generator because if you, a, a battery gets too cold, it was minus 20 degrees, you can't start. So I quickly bolted the battery back in flew the sleeping bag and everything back in and got airborne and then flew from ridge to ridge, no sun compass, but I parked the helicopter facing what I thought was south. I had an Amiga system, but it would work sometimes, generally over the ice it wouldn't, and I managed to get back to the little island called Wardhunt Island where all of the explorers go. Then I want to tell you about the next flight I did, which was a vertical flight around the world, in a twin otter, landing at each pole. It's the only flight I've done that hasn't been repeated and it will be a hard one to repeat because the ice in the North Pole, they tell us, is melting, it's floating sea ice. Now, the problem wasn't trying to find the South Pole. There's a huge American base there and they had a non-directional beacon. But I managed to get approval to fly to Vostok, the most remote place on this earth. It's a Russian station. It's about 1,200 nautical miles from the coast, from Casey Station in Australia, sort of south of Hobart. It's about 1,200 nautical miles to the South Pole. Halfway is the Russian base. And in the Twin Otter, we didn't have enough fuel to get there, so I managed to arrange, talk about a fluke. Uh, the, I was a good friend of Bob Hawke at the time, he got in touch with the Russians, and they towed fuel 700 nautical miles for me to use. Anyway, we took off, and we're heading towards uh, the Vostok. There was no non-directional beacon there, I'd known that, but they did have VHF, they said, on 1215. And so before leaving, I'd fitted to the Twin Otter a VHF direction finder. It had two antennas, it's used by search and rescue aircraft to find locators, locator beacons. And what I'm probably saying to you is I always had a backup on my flights. I write down on an envelope all of the things that could go wrong and then I decide uh, how can I reduce that risk. For example, I bought the Bell Jet Ranger because I was told it was the most reliable and safest single engine aircraft in the world. And I owe my life to North American technology. But just quickly, as I'm flying in the Twin Otter, the plan was to fly from Hobart to KC Base in the daytime. Leave very early in the morning, and of course, when you get to the Antarctic Circle, it's 24 hours daylight in, um, the, uh, in November. Unfortunately, we waited for about two weeks, and eventually the Met Bureau said, look, you'll have a slot to land at KC Base in visual conditions if you take off on the Saturday night. So, we took off on the Saturday afternoon, flew. We took off 40% over gross weight, about 1,000 US gallons in the helicopter. 14 hours later, we're in the air, it's still pitch dark, and the Amiga system we had started to... Is that black? Is that fixed? Is that okay with my voice? I can hear it sort of... It's okay. Yeah. Um, and the Amiga system I had suddenly started to tell us that from going from 140 knots, started to go down and say zero knots. And it, uh, what it had done, it had jumped a lane, but we didn't know that. So we looked at the magnetic compass, it was just rolling around, because here we were, uh, very close to the South Magnetic Pole, which is out in the ocean at the time. It's pitch dark, flipped on the landing lights, and it's just horizontal snow coming towards us. Here we are, about 10,000 feet, three quarters of the way to Antarctica at night, and not being sure which direction to go. Giles Kershaw, my co-pilot, experienced Antarctic pilot, friend of mine, we climbed the aircraft to 18,000 feet without oxygen. I tell you, you can breathe there, but you can't think very well. <laughs> to try and get out of the cloud, because I said, I can find the Southern Cross, I'll be okay. Eventually, we came back to 12,000 feet. We knew that if we had turned, we were going to our deaths. The Amiga said we'd turned and we were heading about 340. So we would have got about halfway back to Adelaide area and dropped into the ocean, the very rough ocean. 
But as luck should have it, we suddenly came out of the cloud. It was fantastic. There was the starlets I had. But there was a slight problem. There was no bloody Southern Cross. It wasn't there. And I said to Giles, Giles Kershaw was a pommy and he knew where the North Star was, but he had no idea where the Southern Cross was. Eventually, I stuck my head. Luckily, the windscreen on a Twin Otter is an angle like this. I stuck my head, and there behind us was the Southern Cross. We were so far south, and I managed to do what I learned in Scouts four and a half times along the major axis, and I said, Giles, I'm sure we've only turned it out 15 degrees to the right, not 180 degrees. And so we kept flying. About half an hour later, the midnight sun came off across, it came up across the bottom of the earth. And we were able to use our sun compass. And then about 60 miles from Casey Base, our non-directional beacon came in. And we were able to land. I remember looking down and we called them up by radio and they said, uh, Dick, uh, we've str taken a, a railway line and graded it across the snow and tried to compact it a bit. Because we could only leave Hobart with wheels, tyres. We had to do our first landing in Antarctic before we fitted the skis on this ice cap type thing. And uh, we were very hopeful. So we came down. I remember looking down and there looked like some matchboxes below us. And they were shipping containers, 40 foot shipping containers that they'd taken up onto the ice cap. We came around and we landed. We only went about 150 feet before the nose wheel dug in, but we were alive and safe. And the mechanic got sent down from. Australia fitted the skis and we then spent five weeks touring Antarctica and by the way Antarctica then it's now the home of bureaucracy but then it was how the world could be we'd visit each nation's base just pop in and go in and have a beautiful Chinese meal or a beautiful Japanese meal or a pretty terrible American meal <laughs> and, uh, as we flew around as I mentioned we had this VHF direction finder to try and find Vostok but something really fantastic happened. You've heard of the Gun Barrel Highway. Well, suddenly we came across the ice bound, the, the, the ice highway to Vostok, where they towed these great big, huge truck tractors, tread tractors, where they towed our fuel up and they were renewing the base. There was the road. And so we followed the road in and landed at Vostok Base. We could hardly, virtually no one spoke English. I remember spending the night there trying to get some sleep. It's about seven and a half thousand feet. And we used the Russians HF radio. I mean, I couldn't believe it. In those days, it was just with Perestroika and Glasnost. But the Russians had this HF radio that took about half an hour to change frequency. And we were trying to call the South Pole. And we'd say, quick, can you dial 6776 up now in the HF radio on the Twinota click, click, click. The aerial tuner would tune in, you're on that frequency. The Russians would have to change coils. And it took 20 minutes to go on a new frequency. I thought, gee, if we had a war with these people, I think we might win. <laughs> it was back in those days. Fortunately, we managed to get the weather from the South Pole Station. And we took off the next day and headed. And at the uh, South Pole, there was a, a very strong non-directional beacon. So we're able to home in. And of course, it's a huge established base. We got it on our surface radar, the radar system in the Twin Otter. One of the reasons I'm alive today is the fact that I've been able to afford the best American technology and it's been very reliable. One of the reasons after five flights around the world and two balloon flights that I don't keep adventuring is all of my heroes kill themselves. And on my flights, there are a number of times when something could have gone wrong and I would not be alive today. As I came down the coast of Burma in the helicopter, I was in rain so thick, you could only see about 100 metres and eventually I saw I was over a beach, so I landed on the beach. And about half an hour later, the monsoon wave band went through, and there in front was a huge headland. The next day, I'm flying down the coast near Phuket, and uh, I thought, gee, that rain's really heavy. I think I'll just fly out from the coast. That'll be safe. When it's very really heavy rain in a jet range, you fly at about 200 feet, because you can vaguely see a horizon. And I'm sitting there, I'm freezing cold, even though it's supposed to be near the equator. I'm frightened as hell, thinking I can't turn, I'll have to keep going straight ahead. But I'll turn a bit out so I don't actually hit the coast where there's a mountain right there. Well, well, after about 10 minutes, minutes so jungle we're going up to another cloud. But then, to my horror, I looked to the right, there were islands higher than me, and I was weaving down between them. They weren't on my map. And that was right at the location where Smithy. Uh, could have, uh, of course, uh, we've been lost his life. We don't know exactly where. So I've had a lot of luck. 
I'm an adventurer for the spirit of adventure. I don't adventure for anyone other than me. It makes me, I love to challenge myself. It's like an addiction. And even now when I fly up the coast, I'm tempted to think, oh, I wonder if I turn, turn right, whether I'd get to New Zealand, whether there'd be a ship on the way. And it's an addiction that unfortunately so many adventurers today have to make up a reason. They're going to make money for charity by doing scientific research. I did it because it satisfied an addiction and I'm having a bit of a problem now that I'm old and I'm not adventuring anymore because my family doesn't want me to disappear. <laughs> now, of course, the balloon flight across Australia, how do you navigate a balloon? Fascinating. By then we had a GPS on board so we, know, we knew where we were. But you don't. Balloon, long distance ballooning is one of the most dangerous pastimes you can be involved in because you have no control. The balloon weighs many tonnes. We took off from uh, Carnarvon on the uh, west coast. First of all, we blew. The, we went the wrong way. I'm saying to, to uh, John Wellington, my co-pilot, John, what are those lights down there? And he said, oh, they're fishing boats. And we were heading towards Africa. <laughs> Luckily, the Met Department had done their job and we climbed up to 20,000 feet. We then got into this incredible jet stream. But we started descending and coming south and after about 12 hours, maybe 13 hours, I looked down and I could see ocean. And we'd actually come down and we're over the ocean at the Great Australian Bight. But they said, don't worry, you won't end up in Antarctica. You will curve up and you'll be okay. When we got over Broken Hill, I built, don't talk has it this, uh, the little gondola, which was all approved, it came from England. But I didn't like being in the gondola, so I built a sun deck and I could plug the sun deck in and out. So when Hazel looked at it, I unplugged the sun deck. But when no one was looking, I put the sun deck and I had a deck chair. And so I would sit up on my deck chair and I've got this wonderful movie, if you go to the Dick Smith Adventure site, where I'm holding a little Super 8 movie camera and I'm sitting on my deck chair and I'm saying, oh, look down there, it's 22,000 feet. Now, I'm going to tell you something. The balloon was doing about 80 knots, 160 kilometres an hour, but it never moved. The whole trip, we never had a bump. You obviously climb into the jet stream and it's just sitting there. In the daytime, the balloon was a combination helium and hot air. At night time, you have to keep the burner on every few minutes to heat up the helium so you don't descend. But in daytime, the sun keeps the helium on, so it's completely silent with this most magnificent scenery. Of course, it's supposed to be on oxygen, I was some of the time. And I remember Pip was flying around in the citation, calling me up and saying, put your safety thing on. And I said, no, I'm not going to let go. <laughs> and I was planning to let go anyway. As we headed towards the East Coast, we got a message that if you don't land tonight, you will end up near New Caledonia the next day. And so we never landed a Rossi air balloon, and it's a big thing, and you might wonder why balloonists go early in the morning and late at night. Because they're sensible, they go when there's bloody no wind. And if they see the wind coming up, they land the balloon really quickly, because a balloon dragging across, you're dragging the power lines, it can hit cliffs and things, it's incredibly dangerous. And that's the problem with long distance ballooning. You have no idea what the weather's going to be like. You wait for the weather pattern to do you great distance, but then you have to take the luck. I've been very tinny with weather because as we got to Tenterfield, not quite across the Great Divide, we thought we'd land because darkness was coming. Then John and I looked at each other and said, but look, we can get the record if we cross the Great Divide. And I remember we got across the divide and we're over the Clarence River and we started, we wanted to descend. So we put, we had a valve on the top of the helium and so we pulled the valve but too much and suddenly we were descending so fast that we would have got killed. So we started throwing everything off. We threw our sand out and we overtook the sand. You'll see the documentary. <laughs> Luckily, I had my deck chair, which I flew out, and we had a Honda generator that was used to charge that. So that went out. We the poor farmers below. And we gradually arrested the fall. And it's coming down. By then, there's five helicopters flying around. And you couldn't, wouldn't believe it. I looked down on the Clarence River and I said, there is no wind. There is no wind. And we came down, threw the rope down, and our friends who had left go of the gondola, who had flown around all the way across in my citation, then catched her own helicopter, were there to grab hold of the rope. Now that was one of the most riskiest things I've ever done. 45 hours in the air, very risky, but I got away with it. Except I did do one other risky flight, and 
interesting in navigation and I really owe my life to the weather bureau. They're so good here, especially for the forecasting in Antarctica. But I decided to try and fly the balloon from Australia to New Zealand because, of course, westerly winds prevail around the world and that's why balloons fly all the way around the world in the jet stream. My mate John Singleton said, no, no, that's ridiculous. The New Zealanders, you get on the bus, then you should fly the opposite way from New Zealand to Australia. And I said, John, that's impossible. A balloon goes with the wind, mate. It's not possible. He said, oh, I'll bet you a hundred grand you can't do it. Well, that was the challenge. So I rang the back mirror up and they said, no, no, of course you can't. But then they said, hold on, let us check if you flew very low and we, there was a high pressure system sitting across the Tasman, you might be able to do it, but the risk is if the high pressure system moves, you'll parallel the coast and you'll end up in Antarctica. So I rang up John Singleton and I said, is the bed still on and we should ship the gondola? to New Zealand and waited for about six weeks and suddenly they said, if you leave tomorrow, you we reckon you could do it. It was something involved with a blocking high over the Great Australian Bight would stop this uh, high pressure system. So we got airborne and this was a low level flight. Instead of being at 23, 24,000 feet, we're a few hundred feet and then a few thousand feet just over the waves. We went up at night time, we were level with uh, Nor Norfolk Island. We couldn't see any lights or anything. And finally, after I think about 38 hours, 40 hours, we were heading towards the coast. But the worst thing happened, we started to parallel the coast. And I thought, we're not going to get there. We'd hired a fishing boat to come out because I knew that if I caused search and rescue, I'd never hear the end of it. You know, Dick Smith risking people's lives for his own fun and all of that. So we hired a fishing boat. We could look down and see the fishing boat. But by absolute luck, the Weather Bureau put an early balloon up at Coffs Harbour and at 6,000 feet, there was an easterly blow. <laughs> Believe that, unbelievable. So we climbed up to 6,000 feet, came in, we dropped the balloon, and lots of people have flown across oceans, but no one has ever landed on the beach. And John Wellington expertly landed the gondola on the outside of the surf, and then we surfed the gondola in. <laughs> and actually landed on the beach, having done the first flight, and probably the only one for I know, I don't know if anyone will be that foolish, from New Zealand to Australia. Thanks for listening to me. I can see that nobody enjoyed that. Nobody was engaged. I said to Rob, I don't know if I'll be able to keep people interested for 20 minutes. <laughs> Um, as luck would have it, Dick said that how many times? Three times. And he used the word luck a lot too, but there's a lot more to luck than just luck. It's good planning and so forth. But the message again today is these were very risky exploits. They were human endeavour experiences that has Dick living his life fully. And so this is not all about aeroplanes today, again, it's about us. It's about us living our life. And Dick's living his life full. And I, I just, that's the message I'm really taking away from. This is inspiring and encouraging and it's wonderful. But I, I want to also say, I spoke to Dick on the phone yesterday. He said, Rob, look, um, you know, can you send me a bit of information about where I'm going to land? He said, I'm not sure, I've double booked myself. He said, um, I plan this weekend to have my grandchildren down at my property to teach them how to drive a car. So um, anyhow, he stepped aside from that, arranged with Pip, for, uh, with Pip to do that. And I just want to say how grateful and how appreciative uh, that I am, and I'm sure you all are, for him coming today to address us. A bunch of people said today, we're really disappointed in Dick Smith. He's not running listening for politics, anybody listening. I have a serious concern, but I'm still half class full. I have a serious concern about aviation because Dick and I and all of us aren't getting younger, we're getting older. There is a wealth of experience in these aviators. As we get older, um, this is going to pass. In 15 years' time, this will be gone. We are in crisis. 
Canberra is not listening to the challenges that we're facing here in aviation. And Dick and I had a conversation a little while ago and I think he said yes, that we're going to try yet again. He's tried many times to champion aviation. Um, Canberra isn't interested in what's happening with general aviation. It's all about airlines. Um, we need to rally, we need to support. Um, look at the spirit that's here today. We've come because we've got a common interest. So we need the support to be able to move forward with regulation and common sense in how to make this industry survive. I could rattle on about this for a long time and I won't hold you any longer. I just want to thank you again, Dick, for a wonderful presentation. Any questions or we've run out of time? No. Four minutes we've got, yes. Max Hazelton, is that Max? Wow, now Max Hazelton. Thanks very much and see you back around 3 o'clock.